but uh, there may actually be more Asian Americans in this room than there were at Yale College in 1969. And uh, uh, Yale, when it became co-ed, had to promise the, the president at that, at that time a very liberal, very benevolent uh, uh, president named Kingman Brewster had to promise to Yale alums that Yale would continue to produce a thousand male leaders every year <laughs> in the world. And so, uh, you know, when I, when I first started uh, uh, Yale in 1967, there were a thousand males, and that was uh, my class. And we had at that time a very uh, progressive, uh, revolutionary in some ways, uh, dean of admissions, a guy named Dinky Clark, mm. who uh, sort of shook up a lot of things by uh, bringing in a class the year before ours that had the majority public school kids. And uh, SAT scores shot up as a result. <laughs> and uh, when our class came in, uh, there was a big uh, story in the Yale Daily News uh, first day that said, Yale admits the brightest class ever uh, because our SAT scores were slightly higher than the class of 1970. And it also said that Yale admits the most diverse class ever. And of course, that meant there are more public school kids, there are more kids on financial aid. But in terms of ethnicity, it meant that there were 11 Asian Americans out of 1,000 men, there are about 11 African Americans, and there are probably five or six Latinos, one of whom was uh, a Mexican American and the others being Puerto Rican. So that was the definition of most diverse class ever. Uh, and of course, we had no women. Okay. And so, uh, 1969, uh, and, I, and I remember uh, coming back to Yale uh, on the either 25th or the 30th anniversary of ASA. So it was either 1994 or 1999 that I came back for a celebration uh, of ASA. And uh, I was asked to be sort of a keynote speaker. And I followed this panel of ASA presidents or chairs or whoever the leaders were. And they gave, quote, a history of ASA. And these leaders represented Largely, you know, the period from the late 70s all the way to 94, 99. And so I remember first saying, uh, when I started, I said, you know, if the class, if this panel before me represented and spoke about the history of ASA, then I guess what I'm going to share with you is the prehistory of ASA, <laughs> so the prehistoric period. <laughs> <laughs> because it really goes back before this, this period that they were talking about. And you have to remember that uh, 1969 was a tremendous period of social change in this country. Uh, you had, you know, the, the black civil rights movement going. You had almost every summer uh, urban riots. You had uh, the anti-war movement going on. Uh, you had the start of the women's movement. You had this youth counterculture movement. I mean, the, the whole place was crazy. Uh, and you had also drugs and everything else, uh, you know, on campus. And uh, I don't know how parents survived that period. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine raising a kid, you know, at that time. Uh, but but I, I thought it was an exciting time. And, uh, you know, uh, Yale, like I said, was going through a, a significant change at that time, particularly with uh, uh, the addition of women. And so aside from a thousand male leaders, uh, males that were in each class, the junior class, which was my class, class of 1971, had 250 women. The sophomore class had 250 women and the freshman class had 250 women. 
So there were uh, 750 women and 4,000 men. Okay? And I think by now it, it's at least 50-50 uh, uh, men and women. And uh, out of the uh, 4,750 students, 59 were Asian Americans. Okay? And um, I remember, uh, you know, I don't know, what, you know, what, uh, the, the sort of start of, of, of ASA, if, if at least I, I try to record this story through, through my life, um, really starts the year before when, um, you know, I grew up in uh, East Los Angeles, which is a predominantly Mexican-American area. Uh, I went to a public high school called Roosevelt High School, uh, which was 80% Mexican-American, 10% black, 10% Asian. Uh, we had absolutely no whites. And um, I... Uh, uh, had friends who were, were Mexican Americans uh, in, in my freshman and sophomore year here, and uh, I um, was one of those that uh, uh, co-founded NECHA, which is the Mexican American organization, <laughs> when I was a sophomore. And you know, when, when I've come back for NECHA celebrations, I don't say, you know, this this room has more, you know, like. Asian Americans that we uh, had. Well, I, I can't say that, but I could say that uh, uh, the founding members of Mecha could actually fit on two sofas. You know, I mean, there were like eight or nine of us who, who started Mecha, and uh, I learned a lot through Mecha, which plays a big role in terms of the founding of Asa. And Yale Mecha learned a lot from what the black students did the year before. And so, Mecha, when it first started, decided, you know, that it would tackle admissions and that it would urge the uh, admissions office to recruit students. It also said, we should have a class on Chicago studies, All right? They said, we should organize a student conference you know, to bring all the other Mexican Americans who are going to schools on the East Coast together to talk about our issues and so forth. And this whole agenda of activities was very much influenced by black students. And uh, so I participated in all of those things. I was involved in their admissions uh, recruitment processes and so forth. And in the summer before uh, my Senior, uh, junior year, the summer of 1969, uh, somebody in Los Angeles, a uh, community leader, who uh, called me and said, you know, I have a person here who is uh, uh, going to go to Yale uh, as a graduate student in psychology. And can you come here and meet with him and so tell him how Yale is? And uh, this person was named Glenn Omatsu. And Glenn would uh, be starting uh, uh, graduate school in psychology at Yale uh, in the fall. And Glenn had been involved with Asian American student activities uh, the year before at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, Glenn uh, sort of asked me, well, what do you do at Yale? You know, what kinds of activities or whatever? And so I was telling him about Mencho. And uh, I was uh, involved in recruiting, uh, you know, Mexican American students uh, for Yale. Uh, that I helped to, uh, you know, establish this course that would be offered the next year uh, on Mexican Americans. That I was involved in the great boycott uh, and so forth. And I remember uh, uh, Glenn asking me, "Well, are the Asian Americans organized at Yale?" And I remember looking at him and saying, well, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, well, why don't we uh, do something about that, then maybe when we go back. And so uh, I remember 
I went back, uh, came back in the fall, uh, I enlisted some other of my friends who, who were Asian American at that time, uh, of the 59, and we literally went through the student directory and we looked at Asian surnames. And, uh, and obviously we, we made some mistakes, you know, with the <laughs> and so forth. Uh, you know, it could be white or black as well as Chinese or Korean or whatever. And we put together, uh, you know, a, a list of people and we just started calling everybody. And we told them that uh, we're thinking of forming this organization and if they uh, were interested to come to uh, my college, Saber College, uh, for dinner uh, on this night, which is exactly what you know the Metro students had done in organizing. They had gone to a residential college and had dinner. And you have to remember that 59 students divided by 12, you know, meant that some colleges only had three, two, one. I think maybe one college had five Asian American students, okay? And uh, for whatever reasons, uh, you know, I, 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 feared, I, I just saw this very early on when I was at Yale in my freshman year, that when Asian Americans uh, approached one another on the street, and if they did not know that person, they would look away. <laughs> and, and I really didn't understand that, okay? But, but that was happening. And, and we happened to get 35 of the 59 students together for dinner. And so we met in the common room. And then we said, well, we're all going to go in there to the dining room. And we're going to you know, have dinner together and talk. Well, you can imagine how everybody else was looking at 35 <laughs> <laughs> students suddenly coming into the dining room, right? And, uh, and some of the 35 Asian American students had never been with 35 other <laughs> Asian American students. And, uh, but, but nonetheless, we you know, had a real nice meeting. Uh, and uh, people said, well, what should we, what can we possibly do? And I remember saying, well, you know, I have some ideas. And this is what the Mexican American students have done. And that's where, in a sense, we followed the exact sort of game plan that the Mexican American students had done the year before, which they obviously copied the year before from the African American students. And so we went to the admissions office fairly quickly to, to ask for funds to recruit students. And uh, we put together, there's, there's actually like a letter in 1969 in which uh, we are uh, asking the admissions office for funds to go and recruit students uh, in, low, in, in basically Chinatowns, in public high schools in uh, Hawaii, uh, because we said, you know, there are 59 students, but they tend to be from prep schools, they tend to be from suburban high schools, and we are missing, in a sense, the so the diversity of Asian Americans. Uh, the vast majority are Chinese or Japanese Americans. We have two Korean Americans, no Filipino Americans. Right? And um, we also said, yes, we need a course. And so, you know, we developed a course, which was offered in the second semester in the spring of 1970. Uh, we also organized the very first Asian American Student Conference in the East Coast, and that was in April of 1970. And uh, we had some 300 students from something like 25 colleges on the East Coast that came together to have a conference together. It's the first time. And um, out of the uh, very first Asian American Studies class, uh, which was designed really by students and run by students. And we had a very, very sympathetic uh, a professor in political science who was the first uh, Asian American tenured professor at, at, US, at, at Yale, uh, named Chitoshi Anaga, who was an expert on Japanese politics. He was from Hawaii. 
and he basically let us run this course. And uh, we also had uh, a wife of the chairman of anthropology. Her name was Mary Rouse. Her husband was Irving Rouse, who was a very, very famous anthropologist. Uh, later got you know, selected as one of the faculty representatives on the admissions uh, committee. And he used to tell us that whenever an Asian American applicant uh, was placed before the committee, that he would always vote to have them admitted. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that, in a sense, is how ASA started. Uh, the Asian American community uh, nationwide has changed substantially from that period. Uh, there were, at that time, a million and a half Asian Americans, uh, according to the 1970 census, in all of the United States. Uh, and every decade ever since, with in a sense, the 1965 immigration laws kicking in, the Asian American population doubles. So now we have 18 million Asian Americans. Uh, the population changes dramatically from one that is majority U.S. born to now majority foreign born. Uh, in 1970, 40% uh, of of all Asian Americans were Japanese Americans. And starting 1980, Japanese Americans start to fall down, in a sense, the uh, numerical ladder. And uh, now they are number six or seven behind Chinese, uh, Indians, Filipinos, Koreans, Vietnamese, and then you have Japanese. And, uh, Hawaii had the most uh, Asian Americans of all states, and uh, by 1980, California overtakes them, uh, and by 1990, uh, California and New York overtake them, and by 2000, California, New York, and Texas overtake Hawaii. And, uh, but it, it's a dramatically different uh, community. Kind of, uh, in 